how the everything was at the shore. You know, I had this feeling in October, you know, we should it should be pretty empty at the North Shore. No. Oh, oh not on weekends. I, unbelievable yeah, not the on amount weekends. of tourism. Yeah. Uh, incredible. Really. Yeah. Okay, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Any... We're here to talk about water quality and the governor's 25 by 25 by 2050 uh, initiative. And, yeah, and I'm John Downing. I'm director of Minnesota Sea Grant. And um, I, I'll tell a little bit about myself and some of my things that I really am interested in about water. But the main thing we're here for is to figure out what you want the governor to know about water and water quality in the future in Northeast uh, region. Um, and this is a town hall meeting, and the town hall meeting is to get your input, and some, we'll summarize it together and get it to the governor. But as I said, I'm director of Minnesota Sea Grant, and Minnesota Sea Grant's job is to uh, work with business industry people of any, any kind in Minnesota and try and get them the science they need in order to manage water well and work with water well, and if science doesn't exist, we build it. Um, we are, um, I also am um, a scientist at the Large Lakes Observatory, and you'll hear from uh, Dr. Robert Sterner in a little bit, too. He runs that outfit, and I'm also a professor at, in the biology department at University of Minnesota Duluth. And I sort of grew up, I always say I grew up underwater, because I grew up in summer times over in Itasca County on the bottom of lakes over there. I was a certified scuba diver when I was nine years old because life was cheap back then and they didn't protect children. And so I went ahead and did that and that got me interested in aquatic science. I still am really interested in aquatic science. It's made my career, these lakes in Northern Minnesota, not exactly the Northeast region. But um, so that's who I am, Lucinda. Yeah, I'm Lucinda Johnson. I'm a uh... Associate Director at the Natural Resources Research Institute, which is part of the University of Minnesota Duluth. I'm also the director of the Water Initiative. Um, I've lived in Duluth for 30 years, but I grew up in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And as an island, as our uh, president just reminded us, uh, island nearly a thousand miles from the mainland, I grew up surrounded by water. Um, ocean in one sense, but also uh, some of the most pristine and also um, polluted fresh water um, I've ever experienced. So I grew up interested in, in water, uh, but I became interested professionally uh, after I uh, took my first job at the Illinois Natural History Survey in Champaign-Urbana. Um, my first real professional job in aquatic ecology was to collect bugs um, upstream and downstream of every sewage treatment plant and um, hmm, nice. industrial <laughs> discharge in some of the largest watersheds in Illinois. And let me tell you, uh, that gave me an interesting perspective on, on water quality. So when I moved to Minnesota, I was um, extremely gratified and excited uh, to find all of the wonderful um, fresh water that is uh, incredibly clean and much more fun to work in. Uh, my own research focuses on trying to understand how people affect um, both water quality and aquatic systems, um, things like fish communities and habitat. But I also focus on effects of climate change, and I've been observing um, more floods and more periods with very, very low flow. So that's the focus of my studies um, here in the Northeast Minnesota. Bob? Uh, thanks, Lucinda. Um, and quick reminder for those of you just clicking in, this is a Facebook Live event to discuss water quality goals connected with Governor Dayton's um, 25 percent um, improvement that he's proposed, and we're starting with some introductions. Um, I am Bob Sterner. I'm also at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Uh, one of the things I do is direct the Large Lakes Observatory, which is the only uh, academic unit in the world dedicated to the scientific study of the Large Lakes of Earth. And being here in Duluth, uh, Lake Superior is one of those very special lakes. 
And so myself and my colleagues, which includes John Downing and others at the Large Lakes, we have been uh, performing a whole variety of research projects on Lake Superior and other large lakes. I, I come to this also, like my colleagues here at the table, I was interested in water kind of as long as I can remember um, and eventually did a PhD in biology at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. And I was there from 1980 to 86. And during that period of time, I undertook my first Lake Superior research cruise. And my career went in a variety of directions and I came back to Minnesota in 1993 as a professor uh, and a limnologist, someone who studies lakes and inland waters of all kinds. And I turned my attention again to Lake Superior because it was a fascinating place. And at that time, in the mid 1990s, there was very little research going on offshore, sort of the lake itself. There was other kinds of projects going on. So I uh, got involved and had my first um, research grant on Lake Superior, actually funded by Sea Grant um, in 1996. So I have been working on Lake Superior ever since, which is more than 20 years. I've been offshore. Um, I've been all over the lake on our research vessel, the Blue Heron, uh, seeing this beautiful and important place uh, from many perspectives. It's a great privilege to have been able to do that. My research is mostly about the interactions between nutrients and organisms. And so that's my specialty. Um, of course, Lake Superior is um, not threatened in the same way as some of the lower Great Lakes are. I'm sure we'll get into this in a minute. But there are some interesting things that we have to say about uh, nutrients and water quality. Um, I want to also say that this particular event connects to this broad statewide effort. Uh, the governor has said that he, he's basically divided Minnesota into several regions, and we are part of the Northeast region, which um, extends well into Ely and Bemidji areas. Um, it's a pretty broad region with its own set of issues. Um, our focus is likely to be on the Big Lake and issues that are very specific to this exact place because we want to take this opportunity to represent this region in this overall statewide process. Yeah, can I add, I just yeah, want to add so a little bit it. to that, Bob. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, and that's really one of the reasons we wanted to have this town hall is that um, the governor can only do so many town halls himself. And um, the regional uh, town hall was in Ely and had its own focus. Mm -hmm. But a lot of us have spread along the coast here and, and in the estuary. Um, have very particular uh, water issues that we're concerned about, and uh, we wanted to have this virtual town hall so that we could gather that long that population that's so broadly distributed together to focus on uh, coastal issues, coastal questions, Lake Superior maintaining its health, and um, uh, questions of the river and the estuary and the harbor that are really special to this region and. I, when we got together, the three of us, to talk about this with some of the other uh, staff in our groups, it just seemed like we should try to keep these questions on the governor's radar um, during this really great initiative. So, uh, and also, I wanted to echo what Lucinda said, about, and what you also said about good water quality, mm -hmm. coming to work in a place with great water quality. I worked 20 years in the state of Iowa, and uh, that agricultural um, effects on water quality. We work with harmful algal blooms and a variety of things like that. What a pleasure to be in a place where we have some good water that we can protect. Yeah. We also have our own problems here, and that's, I think, part of what we'd like to be hearing about. So Lucinda, Lucinda's going to tell us about the governor in a second, but I also want to throw one thing in the beginning. So those of you watching us on Facebook, you have three University of Minnesota researchers sitting at this table. And I want you to recognize that there are hundreds of colleagues of ours at the University of Minnesota doing research on water protection, on water treatment, on water uh, quality of all kinds. And this is a great event for us as researchers to be able to listen to you and hear about your concerns. So please think not just of us three at the table, but of a whole community of researchers who are interested in what you have to say. So, Thanks, Bob. 
So actually Duluth is probably one of the most interesting places on the planet if you're a freshwater ecologist because the concentration of freshwater uh, specialists, people not only who do research but also who um, write about water or paint about water or um, have consulting firms and do restoration. This is a hugely concentrated community of, of water specialists and we're very excited to be part of this community. So what is this 25 by 25 initiative? Um, the Governor Dayton is um, very, very committed to improving water quality in the state of Minnesota. And fundamentally, he is um, throwing this charge out to the people of Minnesota, asking um, what we collectively can do to protect and improve water quality by 25% in and around the state. And in aggregate, he's looking to, to achieve an improvement, an overall improvement of 25% in water quality. But that means that some parts of the state will have a greater emphasis on some types of um, issues like um, nutrients in southern Minnesota. Um, in northern Minnesota, we might be focusing on different water quality challenges or issues that are associated with water quality. So fundamentally, what the governor is interested in is gaining input um, from you, the citizens of Minnesota, to find out um, what goals would protect and improve water quality by 25%, what actions are needed to protect and improve water quality in this region, and what would it take to accelerate the pace of progress for protecting and improving water quality. But we, the three of us, are also interested in hearing your observations about what, quarter, what water quality changes have you observed um, so that we can understand what the needs might be or, or what improvements you've seen, not just what degradations you might have seen um, over the course of, of your experience living here or visiting here in Northeast Minnesota. Yeah, and I'd like to mention also about Facebook Live. It's a medium we haven't used a lot, but we're, we're really enjoying trying this. But uh, if you haven't used it, uh, just be aware that you can comment at any time on uh, just by typing in. And also, if you need to hear the sound, I don't know you, of course, you won't hear this if you're not hearing the sound, but somehow we have to let people know that you need to click on the video in order to be able to hear the, the audio, uh, audio sound. Also, if uh, you um, have, a, if you know of others who um, would be interested in giving their input, you could um, share this link out and, and try and get others in to get their input. Because our, what we really want to do is collect as much information from the public as we can so we can turn that over to the, to the governor and, um, um, and also build that conversation. So please feel free to uh, put your input in at any time simply by typing it in. Um, on what kinds of water quality protection, um, you know, what, are, what should be our goals in improvement of water quality um, by 25% by the year 2025, um, and also what actions we might need to take. Uh, feel free to type in at any moment, um, anytime you'd like to. Otherwise, we'll just keep talking. But we'd, <laughs> we'd love, to, love to hear from you, much prefer it. Uh, we talk to each other quite a bit, luckily, and but uh, um, please, uh, we'd love to have your input. So, Bob, what do you think the top three water quality challenges are for our region? Thanks, Lucinda. Yeah, that's a, um, that's ultimately what we're trying to do here is prioritize these things. I think for as context for that, we've already hinted at the kind of special aspects of water here in this. Um, amazing place with forests and lakes and relatively high water quality. Um, it, uh, our priorities are likely not going to look exactly like the priorities that emerge from other places in the state. Mm -hmm. uh, the calculus here uh, of how humans and water interrelate in a region like ours is going to be very different from an urban center like the Twin Cities or an agricultural region, uh, 
that is one of the wonderful things about the state of Minnesota. It's this big, diverse area with three major terrestrial biomes, prairies and deciduous forests and the boreal, the Great Lakes. Um, and so when we as a region specifically think about how to protect and improve, the governor has uh, outlined this goal of a 25% improvement for the state. Mm -hmm. And we live in a part of the state where human population density is relatively low, but water availability is relatively high. And so um, what will that look like uh, for us? One of the points I think we need to make is in order for the state as a whole to improve 25%, we can't have back slippage yeah. in a region like ours, which enjoys generally high water quality. So emphasis on protection, I think, is very relevant to our region. How do we protect water quality in, in our region? Uh, Many people in our region, in, in spite of the fact that Big Lake is here, many people depend on groundwater. And uh, groundwater in this part of the state is um, not very well described. Yeah. And how, how, do, how do human actions influence groundwater? It's, there are a lot of question marks about that. I know it's a point um, uh, you, you can make probably better than me, John. Um, uh, the I look out my window every day at Lake Superior, and it's this immense reservoir of uh, amazing water, but it's not static. It's changing over time. There are things going on in this lake that uh, we've been able to identify, yeah. and so um, we need to make sure that the human actions that we undertake, the policy and the voluntary actions that we undertake, are achieving that protection. Um, examples include sediment load. Mm -hmm. So sediment can be a big local problem. Uh, the, the Knife River project in Minnesota is a good example of this. Of attempts to, to manage stream sediment load, in this case to protect especially um, a particular kind of trout. But um, that's, so ma managing and maintaining these local projects either for improvements or for protection is really important. So the last thing I want to say about this, and another thing which is a different calculus than many of the things that will come up in the 25 by 25 conversation, is one of the major threats to our region and Lake Superior is the very big, very diffuse problem of climate change. Um, this is truly a global problem, mm. and Minnesota needs to do, in my opinion, everything it can to contribute to the solution to that problem. But it is a major challenge for Lake Superior, something I hope we'll get into a little later in this conversation. So I'm not sure I, I have a clean list for you, Lucinda, but managing sediment, um, getting a better understanding of groundwater, and being part of the solution to climate change yeah. are certainly up there on my list. Yeah. Isn't Lake Superior warming faster than most water bodies on the, on the planet right now? I think Jay Austin did some terrific work on that. Um, it is. Um, yeah. So summer surface temperature, uh, the temperature the lake achieves in the summer, is rising faster than the overall air temperature. Yeah. The physics behind that is not too terribly complicated, but we probably won't get into it. But the, the sort of peak summer temperature that people experience, say, when they're swimming or something in the lake, that is going up at an incredibly rapid rate. And that's an, that part of the lake is a very biologically active part, too. So the lake ecosystem is responding, but we don't understand that very well. Oh. Well, another issue associated with climate change is just the large number of big storm events that yeah. we've been experiencing and the uh, number is not just increasing, but also the intensity of these storms is increasing. And this has implications for water quality in our small streams, mm -hmm. as well as our lakes, as well as Lake Superior. And, and it's something that I'm studying um, in, in we, our We might uh, have a question from, we have yeah, we actually questions, have, comments? We have several questions. Great, great, so wonderful. Like to, uh, Thank you. Get, uh, some are questions, some are comments. I'll start with a comment that relates 
to something that was said earlier, I think, by Bob. Um, JT says, I want the governor to know that Polymat poses, poses a threat to Lake Superior water quality and that if copper sulfide mining is too risky to boundary waters, it's also too risky for Lake Superior, which has 10% of the world's fresh surface water. Do you guys want to say something about that? Sure, I think, it, I mean, it's a good point. We, we have industry and we have water and we, um, and I think uh, industry and water need to live well together and uh, take some science and some care. And, uh, um, you know, I think uh, we have two huge industries in northern Minnesota that are tourism uh, based on water and our beautiful forests. And we also have extraction industries and um, have working to find ways of having them live well together is, is I think, really an important thing to do. I know it's on a lot of people's minds. Um, and yeah, no, I, I, JT, I, I, you know, let's uh, let's make things work. Um, we like to. Everybody likes money. Every most everybody likes a nice, clean environment too. So. Uh, a companion comment I would say is from Marty, who says, "I want Governor Dayton to know that water quality is closely tied to tourism in northeastern Minnesota. Protecting water is good for our local economy." And um, Remember to repeat or paraphrase what was said if you have an answer. answer. Yeah, I, 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 I just, you know, tourism, uh, tourism is extremely sensitive to good water quality. Why do people come here? Just this weekend, I took my cousins from Texas around the North mm -hmm. Shore, and unbelievable how people flock here to see this wonderful environment. And clearly, preservation. It's so much less expensive to preserve something than it is to rebuild it. I know that after years of working on lake restoration in Iowa, that was nutrient uh, issues and, and big green and blue green alg algal blooms. Um, but sure, uh, we're, tourism, I, I can't believe the fantastic tourism hmm. opportunities we have here on the North Shore. True. Anybody else want to talk about that? Just, um, tourism and recreation both um, are very water centric. M many of us live on water bodies. We visit water bodies, so it's it's clearly something that we value. Um, it's also an asset from the standpoint of um, supporting our clean drinking water, industrial processes, and other kinds of um, activities that generate jobs and um, wealth in our community. So it's the hardest thing to do is to figure out how to apply the best science to keep water um, as clean as possible. There's a piece of that that I'd like to comment on which fascinates me because tourism and recreation depend on water quality, but maybe just as much they depend on the perception of water oh, quality. Right. and. So currently, we're known as this region of vast uh, water resources um, and high quality experiences like walking along the North Shore trails or something like this. Um, I think it's worth keeping in the conversation now, what would happen if we sprinkle in some maybe very local um, small problems from the sense of you know, observed from space or something. But if 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 we start to see problems that um, attract attention, the reputation of the region yeah. could suffer. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's an interesting thing because you're sort of managing public perception and um, uh, uh, op opinions as much as the actual water quality itself. Well, Bob, made, you made this point the other day when we were talking about this, and if we would allow the water quality in Lake Superior to decline by 1%, it's such a huge amount of water in the state of Minnesota that it could basically wipe out all, yeah. all improvements we make anywhere else. I think that was an important thing for us to remember. Cindy, do we have more? We have Cindy Hagley is, is, is watching the, the feed. And can you, do we have some we more? Do. Oh, great. Um, this one is a question, a little bit on a different tack, but I think it's an important one. Um, Norm asks, 
please talk about the buffer zones between farms and waterways. And I think in our region, there's less farming. We could also mm -hmm. maybe talk about the importance of having buffers of vegetation. And um, remember to repeat the question. So let, let me tackle this because it's actually a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart for a number of reasons. Um, Norm asked us to comment about buffer zones. Um, while buffer zones are an important management practice that can help both farmers and folks that are doing development um, in the areas adjacent to streams um, to prevent the input of nutrient sediments and, and other kinds of contaminants from moving from the upland into an adjacent water body. But it isn't just streams and it isn't just these human activities. Um, buffer zones are also important for shading streams um, in order to keep um, water temperatures from spiking too high in the summertime. And that's one of the ways that we help to mitigate um, climate change impacts. So in Northeast Minnesota, where agriculture is not a dominant land use, uh, we're really concerned about water quality degradation from the human activities that take place in the vicinity of um, water bodies. And that can even include recreational activities, things like um, using um, uh, ATVs in the areas right next to streams, those can contribute to erosion, which contributes to degradation of water quality. So buffer zones are important, not just in south, southern Minnesota, um, but as a management tool, it's a relatively inexpensive and um, very, very effective way to uh, uh, mitigate water quality. But it is true, though, that you take that land out of production. If you're if you're a farmer, mm -hmm. or if you're a, if you're a producer of uh, agricultural products, that's land that goes out of production, and um, or maybe should never have gone into production. But in any case, some mm -hmm. agricultural programs incentivize it. So it's it, it's a non-trivial problem, and it's sure from the water standpoint and from the, the farmer's standpoint. Yeah. Uh, I certainly do understand that, but it, it's true what Lucinda says. I've seen it a bunch of places that, that the um, having a buffer between a water body and same is true for shoreland development. We have yeah. what about eighty billion dollars worth of uh, lakeshore in uh, in our in well not in our region but this region and across northern Minnesota. And the quality of the, the price of that property depends a lot on the water quality, and the water quality will decline if you don't leave those buffers. You have erosion and phosphorus loss and a bunch of other stuff. Two, I do want to make two quick points about this. It's a great question. We're talking about the importance of buffers. Um, and it is, it is a big, big dominant uh, issue in southern Minnesota and farmland less so in our region, but even here in Duluth, Miller Creek, which uh, its headwaters are essentially up somewhere around Miller Creek Mall. I can't remember exactly, but it's channelized and um, it's uh, impaired for trout and uh, many of the same issues about what do we do with private land alongside this creek are right here in this region. Right. Um, the other thing to say about this is this: the research is very uh, compelling that if we increase buffer strips, we will improve water quality. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about that general relation. What's more difficult is the individual landowner would want to know, does my land contribute? If I take my land out of production or do something to which may have an economic consequence for me, will that make a difference? That's a much more difficult question to answer. Yeah. Um, but it's it's sort of the world we live in. Well, I have a friend yeah. just west of here who is a very responsible farmer, and um, uh, very responsible indeed. And um, he doesn't want to cause any pollution, and it's been suggested that he does, and he keeps good buffer strips and uh, keeps them maintained. Uh, Many of the agricultural producers I have met are very environmentally in tuned, and they need good water too. You can't give bad water to livestock, for example. 
So Any I thank you, and I want to uh, read a comment that's really relevant to that, and then I'd like to move on to a, a new topic. So Mindy writes, I'm concerned how larger rainstorms, shorter snow seasons, and a warming climate will have on Minnesota waters, especially in northern Minnesota. We love our cold water fish, and they are worth protecting. So if you could just quickly paraphrase that, because I think there's a bunch more comments. We don't want to leave them. Yeah. Here. Well, Mindy's concerned about um, changing climate and changing runoff and floods and so on on fisheries and stream quality. And um, it, it is hard to predict how these uh, will develop. We do know uh, that conditions are warming. I'm, I'm aware of lakes in, in our region that uh, are where the, uh, there's not enough oxygen in the lower waters where it's cool for the trout to be able to reproduce, or in Anciscos, and that makes a big problem for them. I think that's a, a very cogent comment that there, you know, the, there are really complicated linkages between weather, storms, and the quality of water, and, it, and water has a memory that remembers what happened to it. It forgives, but it doesn't forget, let's say. So we have a number of questions that relate, again, to, our, to mining and mining issues. And I'd like to read, or comments, I'd like to read more than one of them at once so that we can um, kind of lump them together a little bit. So Alan writes, I'd like to know, is the Tailings Basin's pump back system of the proposed polymet copper nickel mine based on the system at Mintac? And um, a second one, industry and freshwater living in harmony together I've heard of that before. What's it called? The sixth mass extinction. So there's two of them, but let's see if our if our people here know the answer to the one about the tailings based on pump back system. Well, oh, I, I don't know the answer, but I okay, repeat, repeat. Yeah, the, the question I can't repeat the question. It's about a, a technical issue having to do with tailings ponds and their function. Um, where was the design where the design come from? What I hear in that since we're giving feedback to the governor, that's the purpose of this town hall, is a concern for, um, for uh, tailings, um, tailings pond influence on the water resources of our region and that there should be extraordinary care taken to protect those resources uh, during any kind of potential development. I think that's a, a piece of feedback that um, should go back to the governor's office. Uh, relatively certain that he's received that, um, uh, we should underscore that. So I want to um, focus us back to, th these are important questions, um, but I want to reiterate that we're interested in having you answer um, three specific questions. Um, the first is, what goals would protect and improve water quality by 25% in this region? What actions are needed to protect and improve water quality? And what would it take to accelerate the pace of progress towards protecting and improving water quality? And in the meantime, we'd also um, really like your uh, response to the question behind us. Um, what water quality changes have you observed? Here's an, um, uh, JT wrote back again, and thank you for your response to his first part of this question. He'd also like to ask, um, um, in your estimation, and this is related to um, copper nickel mining, is Lake Superior less vulnerable or less important than the Boundary Waters Canoe Area? That's impossible to answer. Um, I, I love questions that are impossible to answer. I'm glad for that Could one. You repeat what he, yeah. the, the, um, the viewer asked whether Lake Superior or the Boundary Waters were more vulnerable to these various challenges. And um, I, you know, I don't know, I, I kind of doubt anyone at the table here is gonna have a definitive uh, you know, vote one way or the other on that. They're both very vulnerable systems uh, for possibly different reasons. Um, the gigantic nature of Lake Superior, you might think makes it somehow um, protected because there's all that water. How can we possibly change it? But Humans change the whole globe, so why couldn't humans change one lake? Um, things that we're doing are changing that lake, so it is vulnerable. All of these systems are vulnerable to threats like invasive species. And one of the comments, there was a question earlier about climate change. Um, I think it's important to recognize that 
uh, overall, as lakes warm, they become more vulnerable to um, establishment of invasive species. That's true for small and large lakes. So um, I, I think in some ways, all of these systems are very uh, threatened and very vulnerable to specific threats. And one of the goals of my research life is to try to establish what those connections are and better understand those threats. Right. I, you know, I, you mentioned invasive species. I, invasive species are expanding in colonization of Minnesota waters by about 6% per year, which is down from about 12% per year in the past, which it's good. And if we hadn't made those efforts, virtually every water body in the state would have at least one invasive species by now. You know, I was, I was going to, Lucinda had asked me what my choices for. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, well, I, I'm very concerned about invasive species. The lake that I grew up on and my family's had property on for 108 years has one invasive and maybe a second one. It means a lot to me. That ecosystem is very, very fragile one. It's, a, again, another one of these sensitive systems uh, like the Boundary Waters, like Lake Superior. It doesn't have much nutrient in it. And changes happen really fast. And the things like starry stonewort, which is, and uh, they're, you know, banded mystery snail, these are, and zebra mussel and so on are, are, are really important things. I'm really concerned about septic systems. You know, we put, Bob mentioned groundwater a little while ago. We put stuff underground and think it's gone away, but it hasn't gone away. It's just in the ground. It doesn't disappear. It's just hidden down there. So that's a concern. And how do we protect our groundwater, which I think is the least well understood of our water resources. But geologists, when they talk about lakes, they talk about them as an outcropping of the groundwater. It's just a place where the groundwater sticks out of, uh, sticks out of the ground. Uh, so that's important. I think also healthy shoreland and good, it, just like the buffer strips uh, or buffers around streams, um, good shore protection is really important. And can, if you don't do it, you can have a huge effect. Um, the, what, as to the question of what is more vulnerable, boundary waters or, 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 or Lake Superior, what I hear in that is a concern that we need to protect our, again, protect the good um, in our region, not allow it to be degraded because that would counterbalance um, even any uh, other major improvement that we make elsewhere in the state. That relates closely to a comment by Bridget, who says, if we allow sulfide mining in our region, our water will be polluted, including our drinking water. Is there any research being done on the effects of this pollution on human health? Sulfide or runoff? Well, again, I think, the, so the question from Bridget was, um, sulfide mining, will that impact drinking water? And I'm trying to remember the statistics on how much of our drinking water comes from groundwater in our region and how much from surface almost doesn't matter because they're interconnected. I think protection of, ground, of drinking water sources is a very important thing to do. Um, you know, do. Do we have research going on at the boundary of the interface between human health and, and uh, water quality? There is very little of that and I wish there were more. And I think so what I am taking from Bridget's question is um, we need to be looking at what is the interface between, uh, you know, if we're thinking of um, how we improve water quality for human consumption or for human use, we need to be thinking about the human health aspects of, of any kind of change that we make to surface water is how I'm taking it. But in terms of feedback to the governor, do you guys have thoughts on that? Well, I would sort of add that um, uh, probably bigger threats to our drinking water, uh, especially in northern parts of the state, are things like um, road salt, uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, causing increased salinity in our water uh, systems. Um, nitrate pollution down south is a huge and very, very um, insidious problem in agricultural areas. And then degrading infrastructure, these older lead pipes um, which are causing increased lead in our drinking water are a, a big issue. So um, it, it's not just the um, anticipating future threats, but we have some ongoing threats that we need to worry about. Mm -hmm. uh, 
aging infrastructure is just a huge and very, very costly um, issue that we're facing around the entire country. Um, did you know that in Duluth we still have wooden pipes? That's amazing. It's, yeah. it's, some of the well, not all of infrastructure all. Yeah, yeah, um, is so old that um, it's not just the aging uh, infrastructure underneath the ground, but you know, underneath our houses and going from our houses to um, the, the treatment plants. Um, these are huge and very costly issues. Well, and the other, another one, of course, is lead in drinking water, which is an issue, but that's more due to our infrastructure as well. And maybe it's our own, in our own houses, our infrastructure. But um, the, the, the drinking water is, uh, and my grandsons come, come to my house, they live in the Twin Cities, they come to my house and they want to open the tap immediately so they can have a drink of Lake Superior. They really like that concept. So, Do we have more, Cindy? Yeah, and this one is a little bit different again. This is from Chris who says, with changing nutrient delivery dynamics and increasing temperatures associated with global change, I'm concerned about the northward expansion of harmful, harmful algal blooms and environmental impacts that they will have on our good water quality systems in northern Minnesota. These blooms can produce toxins that can kill fish, wildlife, and pets, and can make humans very ill, and potentially could be lethal. Um, I'm sure we have people on our panel who can speak to that comment. Yeah, I, I, I live literally immersed in those kinds of issues for quite a while. And, and uh, so the question is, uh, nutrients give us harmful algal blooms. Harmful algal blooms are called harmful because they are to people, to pets, to fish, to other organisms. You know, we have sort of garden variety sorts of blue-green algae, cyanobacteria is what they're really called, uh, that actually are blooming in some of our northern lakes and causing tox toxicity problems. Um, if you, I've watched these little food fish organisms when those cyanobacteria are around the blue-green algae and they, they can't make a living. It's just too toxic. We also, when I was working in Iowa, dealt with pets who would drink this green scum and they'd be dead within 24 hours. But add to that sort of the spread of some of the invasive cyanobacteria or blue-green algae. There's one with a wonderful name of Cylindrus bromopsis rasaborskii. I don't know. It's a household term, right? But um, this one is moving north, um, and it is about a thousand times more toxic. So it's another good reason, I think, to protect the quality of our waters in this region is to avoid those kinds of toxins as much as possible. So in order to address that, what are what are the potential solutions that you would uh, suggest? Jeff? Right. I mean, it's it's keeping nutrient runoff as low as you can. Don't fertilize with phosphorus fertilizer. Uh, clean streets. I mean, there are very simple things that we all can do, each one of us, uh, in order to protect the quality of the waters. Keep buffer strips. Don't over-fertilize our lawns. I, I've seen so many sidewalks fertilized with part of, you know, they are not going to grow, so I think we shouldn't fertilize them. Um, and uh, also, I think, uh, uh, repairing, uh, repairing septic systems where they failed or even where they're less efficient is a good thing to do, mounded systems, it's expensive, but it protects our waters. All kinds of things people can do to protect uh, protect water against nutrients that cause harmful algal blooms. I agree with Chris, I think harmful algal blooms are something we haven't experienced a lot here, although Rainy, Rainy Lake has had some and various bays around Lake Superior have. Uh, it's, it's all about managing those nutrients and that fertilizer basically that we're using in agriculture and on our lawns and also our sewage. So um, that'd be my, my feeling, that's what you can do. So I wanna to add to that, those are great comments. And we're discussing a comment from one of the viewers who uh, wrote it beautifully, uh, linking climate change and sediment delivery and invasive species and how, that, um, how those come together to affect water quality in our region. I agree with everything that John and Lucinda have said so far. But I think they left one big piece out, which is 95% of the Lake Superior watershed is forested. And Lake Superior is a forest product, was how I saw it put oh, somewhere yeah. on Twitter yeah. recently, which I really liked. I'm gonna keep saying that. Lake Superior is a forest product. And so land management practices in uh, forestry can have dramatic, I think, uh, impacts 
on receiving waters downstream, including uh, in our region. And um, these episodic events that were mentioned by the viewer, um, what happens when we have these massive storms? We've had a couple uh, amazingly huge storms in recent few years. Of course, the 2012 flood, which ripped out so much infrastructure in Duluth. And just last year, there was a very significant rainfall, mostly concentrated in the southern shore uh, in Wisconsin. Both of these events delivered huge amounts of material from the land through the streams and the rivers into the lake. The National Park Service in the Apostle Islands, after both of these events, observed and documented small, localized, but nevertheless irrefutable examples of blooms of algae that are known to be harmful. They weren't harmful. Those algae did not produce toxins, but the, they were the type of algae which can produce toxins. And they were visible to the human observer on a beach. And getting back to a comment I made earlier, what, what changes would occur to our region if these became regular events? Mm -hmm. They would still be local. We're not going to turn Lake Superior into Lake Erie. But if these local events become commonplace, they change public perception. Yeah. And furthermore, there are in parts of the lake where there's a lot of human contact and that are really important to fish breeding. So there's a kind of a magnification here where even issues that seem kind of small from space or small from the standpoint of our region or of our huge Great Lake, they can have greatly accentuated impact on our region. And so we have to be very mindful of these things. I love that question. Yeah. I'd like to share a comment by Kristen who said Lake Superior is not only a forest product, it's also a wetlands product. Good point. Uh, yeah, true enough. You, very good. You yeah, certainly so, do yeah. see that down in the harbor when you look at the color of the water. It's uh, certainly true. That is an opening for Lucinda. Do you, yeah, yeah. Do you want to yeah, go? Talk well, about I, I don't know <laughs> yeah. if they can do Yeah, that, 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 right. Okay. <laughs> it's from Kristen, the comment. And, and uh, that. Uh, did you say Kirsten or Kristen? It's Kristen. Yeah. Kristen. And um, yeah, it's not only a forest product, but a wetland product. Uh, and that's what is one of the things that keeps Lake Superior uh, safe safe from water quality harm. But this is where Lucinda works, and also Val Brady and others. So. Yeah. Well, one of the things we need to remember is that wetlands perform lots and lots of wonderful, what we call ecosystem services. So not only do they filter sediments and nutrients out of uh, any kind of, of receiving water and uh, that flows through them, but they also are wonderful habitat. They absorb lots of water, so they also help to mitigate the effects of, of floods. So um, we need to keep protecting those wetlands, and that would be one of the goals that I would suggest that we need to um, inform the governor about is uh, the goal of, of maintaining and protecting and enhancing even um, existing wetlands, not just along Lake Superior, but everywhere in the watershed. Well, they also give you a big buffer against floods, and you've got to have some place for that water to infiltrate, and they're very important. I'd, I'd like to suggest to everybody, please, we've only got about 15 minutes to go here, and we really are appreciating the comments that you're making that we'd like to transmit to the governor. Feel, Feel free to type in uh, answers to what goals uh, would protect and improve water quality by 25% uh, in Lake Superior, North Shore, St. Louis River, Duluth Superior Harbor region. Second question is, what actions are needed to protect and improve water quality in this region? And how might we speed up the pace of progress toward protecting and improving water quality in our region? And also. Tell us what you've observed, if you could. We've got to pace it up behind us here, that question. Uh, what, um, what have you seen in terms of water, water quality um, in our, the Northeast region um, that you're concerned about or proud of? Um, and also, at, we will summarize the input. So this is a quick way of you getting that information to the governor. We, are certainly, um, we certainly feel that the governor will pay attention to the output from this town hall. Please put in those comments. We'll summarize them. Also, there's a portal for you to be able to put your comments in directly. 
And uh, the way I find it is I look at 25 by 25 Minnesota, and I find it there pretty quickly uh, just on some search engine. Um, but please um, feel free to type, type in anything you'd like. We probably won't get to all, the, uh, all of these comments. Uh, let me um, be fair to Kristen and tell you what else she had to say. Okay. Don't mind. Kristen had more. Yeah. While we avoid pollution by individuals, which is critically important, we cannot allow powerful corporations to operate outside of their permits or enter into highly toxic industrial projects simply because they are powerful. That's a her statement that you'd like to share with other Dayton. Right. And I, Kristen, I think the comment that goes back is, uh, to the governor is uh, uh, it's important that the water be protected even though we may be uh, trying to also enhance economic activity is how, how I'm reading that comment. And I think that the governor um, very much shares Kristen's um, perspective. I have, I, did you want to add something? I guess I would add that um, I, I understand the comment, I sympathize with the comment, um, at some level, no matter how large the corporation, their activities are governed by something that we academics like to call the social contract. And it is, um, it is that relationship between these large industries which potentially have a really big footprint on our world and the communities around them, the communities which they, they affect, which um, which gives them permission to do what they do. And so it's a big, noisy, complex political process, how we sort these things out. But um, uh, it's by speaking out that we let our voices be known. So thanks for that. I have um, a statement here that's about the uh, pipelines. Um, do you, there's a good long statement that we won't read right now, but do you agree with the Commerce Department recommendation and not, not only that the replacement for line three be denied, but that the current pipeline operating now at little under half its capacity be shut down and removed. Well, that would be a political and policy question. Uh, do, uh, do, the question is, do we, um, uh, do, would we, do we think pipelines should stop operating altogether to transport crude oil across the Great Lakes Basin? I think is the gist of that. Um, I don't think that I would be prepared to to comment on a policy issue, I'm not supposed to, um, being that we are part of the University of Minnesota. I think that's, I think it's an important set of questions to ask. Crude oil tends to move someplace, whether you put it in pipes or trains or trucks. And until we stop using oil, of course, you stop running it one way, it's going to go another way. It's going to move until in New York State still use, uses petroleum that comes from Alberta, then it's going to go through our, our, our region in some way. I think that's a very important conversation to have as a region. We've started that in Sea Grant by bringing together um, uh, industry and environmental groups and policymakers and scientists to, to, to try to solve these problems before they become huge. The science needs to be there. Oil op uh, functions very differently in freshwater than saltwater, and we know more about how it works in saltwater than in freshwater. So uh, many of us are uh, share that concern about the uh, potential impact of petroleum, um, uh, petroleum spill. Uh, I think our job as a society is to find ways that we're going to use it, of moving it in a way that doesn't harm our water resources. Uh, Water, of course, is the new petroleum, basically. It's probably the most strategically important resource on the planet. It's a very good, uh, very, very good set of questions, almost insoluble set of questions. I will keep going. We have a number more of additional questions here, and I'm going to pick ones that I think um, your expertise really lends itself to. We can't answer them all during the call. Uh, do you feel that Polymet's proposed tailings basin design would be able to withstand for perpetuity all the variables found in nature, including increased severe weather events due to climate change, what level of risk to Lake Superior would be acceptable? I, the question was, do we think that um, tailings pond designs would work in perpetuity regardless of what happens? And 
it's it's a question that answers itself really um but um the question that goes to the governor is what is a reasonable degree we need to determine a reasonable degree of protection i think and i'm sort of reading into this a comment to go to the the governor what how do we decide on the social contract and what is a reasonable degree of risk to take for economic gain um i don't know have the technical expertise nor do i think any of us uh do to comment directly on the adequacy of a given design um but i think designs we need to transmit to the governor the concept that um this this uh that several people uh feel that those are important considerations to lend substantial weight to i appreciate the question i also can't answer that i'm sorry uh to the person who asked it about the uh he's really asking an engineering question about the proposed construction of the tailings basin and i have no way of answering that question in a satisfactory way what i would say is i appreciate the question when i look at the polymet issue which is a i'm glad i'm not making the decision about what to, where to go with that um but when i look at it that's one of the questions i myself have and it gets to how we as a society and you know, acting through our government and everything else how we manage potentially catastrophic risk which we're really pretty lousy at doing yeah and so a 1% chance of some massive problem how do we how do we how do we anticipate that how do we manage against it um it's something we as humans really do pretty poorly mm -hmm. and um we're just seeing it uh, amplified in this polymet discussion well it's especially problematic i think when you consider that the conditions are changing i think one of the commenters suggested that under in perpetuity under all possible circumstances we don't even know what those circumstances are you know there are problems that are insoluble but then you have yeah. to look take a systems approach to try to figure out a way to protect as best you can um the interests of the environment while allowing people to actually make a living it's it's very complex set of issues but i think that comment that goes back to the governor is that those questions need to be asked and answered the best we can I'd like to say we only have a few minutes left another 4 minutes and please uh we'll be glad to summarize um summarize your answers that you'd like to get back to the governor on the goals for protection and improvement of water quality uh in our region actions to take how to accelerate it and what you've observed so please type them in pretty quickly because I think we're down to about uh 4 minutes uh, uh coming up here I want to share a comment that's very relevant to what you were just talking about from Kristen who says to protect our region's water quality we must abide by the laws in place to protect the headwaters. Unfortunately there are efforts afoot to circumvent those laws. Well Kristen we're headwaters to three different watersheds which is quite a remarkable thing and um and I think the policy science interface is a fantastic place to work. um if anyone out there is interested a graduate uh, student uh, uh is interested in following that uh, avenue the sea grant program has a canals fellowship where we try to place scientists into uh policy positions for a year's period please i i do think that interface has been um neglected really many of us in science feel that getting into policy is not where we um should be we should be creating great science to solve problems on the other hand it doesn't do any good if it's not integrated into policy no, right. nobody else wants to take that oh, one yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're looking at the clock too no, but i can i i think yeah. this will be a good one to throw in right here at the tail end um christy says i think microplastics pollution is a growing concern in oceans and i think there could be future research on how it impacts ecosystems in lake superior so if you'd like to address that i'll jump in quickly on that um it is uh, it's, well before i answer that question i know we're running out of time but i have really enjoyed this experience and i've lived my life as a researcher and um an opportunity to hear what's on people's minds is incredibly valuable to me that 
flow of information from those of you out there watching this who essentially pay the bills for us to do our research one way or another. Um, uh, you need to be able to talk to us more about what's on your mind and what kinds of research we do. Um, and in that spirit, um, there is work on microplastics going on in our region. There is a lot more research on microplastics in the marine realm than in freshwater. That's true. But there is work going on in freshwaters. Um, there are microplastics in the Lake Superior ecosystem, even far offshore. We know that. Um, one big point that needs a lot more work is the role of plastics in transmitting potentially harmful substances. Right. Yeah. So the plastics themselves are kind of inert, uh, but they can bind things which aren't. And what happens when um, substances, whether they be pharmaceuticals or other things, uh, bind uh, to plastics and then find their way into the food web? Uh, there is research going on on this. There is not enough. And um, I think it's really important to raise that issue a number of these questions today strike me like grant proposal ideas. Yeah. Uh, these are things those of us at the table here really want to know more about. And it's our business to generate the knowledge. Yeah. A, a key thing about microplastics is that um, we still don't have a very good idea of what the concentration is and whether that concentration um, poses a risk. And then thirdly, um, what are the associated contaminants that might be absorbed to those components and um, subsequently what what is the impact on the ecosystem as a result of those compounds yeah so lots of really fundamental uh, research questions that just have not been answered yet yeah the, even the big pieces of plastic when they get beat up turn into small plastics yeah. and can be sent through the food chain I uh, that's an area that's expanding pretty pretty rapidly. I'd like we're about to close. I think we're coming up to the end here. But um, again, um, we'll leave this this site will stay open for your comments over time, right? And so, uh, please, um, we need to get a report to the governor by the fifth of October. We want to have it done by the fourth of October. So, please uh, feel free to continue bring bring other people to the site. That the video will stay. Uh, Video of this discussion will stay up on the site, um, and you can and encourage others to put their comments in. We'll summarize those comments and bring them into our report that goes to the governor uh, by his deadline on the 5th of October. And I, I'd like to say that I've enjoyed this experience too. It's a chance to uh, be in touch with a, a broader broader community, and uh, it's hard in when we think of the North Shore because we're spread out along a you know long distance and. Um, I really have appreciated the very thoughtful input that we've received and um, appreciated everybody who jumped into this conversation. We all worry about water and care about water. It's probably the reason we live here, right? And, um, and the reason we can live well here. So I'd like to thank you. And likewise, please uh, thank you for your time. It's hard to take time out of everybody's busy day. We appreciate the fact that you took an hour out of your busy schedule. and participated in this um, great discussion. We look forward to submitting your input to the governor.